All right, g'day guys. Welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Uh, coming at you from a beautiful spring morning here in Virginia. And today I'm going to be talking about the Eagles and their, the current injury situation, which is uh, pretty dramatic. I guess this kind of will serve as my Eagles corner video this week. Uh, I dropped the ball a little bit on that on the last couple of weeks due to lack of time. Uh, but I also think after two smashings against the D's and the Cats, I don't know how interesting it will be as far as content goes to just review games where we got flogged in. So this video will kind of serve as my Eagles corner video just to talk about where the Eagles are at um, and covering the dramatic injury situation, which is getting worse by the day. So obviously, I don't really need to spend too much time setting the scene. I'm sure everyone remembers the dramatic injury situation of last year, which was exacerbated by COVID, but there were a lot of actual injuries happening as well. And we went into this year hoping that with a better injury run, or at least I certainly did, we'd be able to play some better footy and uh, potentially move up the ladder a little bit. But it, apparently that is not going to be the case where we've cursed ourselves, the injury gods hate us, and uh, we're pretty much back where we were 12 months ago, save for COVID uh, not playing its its role with, you know, isolations and stuff. We're still probably not able to fill f four fit emergencies going into our Port Adelaide game. The team is going to be uh, released sometime probably after this video drops. From what we've heard, uh, we've got about 24 fit players on the list, uh, which means there's a couple of mystery ones as well still would come. We're just going to be naming players as emergencies that cannot actually play. The wild thing is that um, this has all happened in about three weeks from the Western Derby. Apparently we went into that game with three or four, I think it was four injuries, some of them short term, some of them, some of them long term. Admittedly, there were some key players in Nat Nui and Yo, uh, but now that's ballooned out to at least eight unavailable players which probably puts us at that 24 mark maybe 25 we had seven from that Western Derby I think even after the Melbourne game the Melbourne game we actually got through unscathed so we had no direct injuries from the Melbourne game but we've still accumulated 18 injuries since the start of the second quarter I think of the Western Derby so how has this happened again uh, that's that's a question as good as anything there's a lot of Eagles fans out there and it's human nature to want to blame something for this horrendous situation that we're in my opinion is that like how much of it is bad luck how much of it is poor strength and conditioning are there other factors to be honest I think it's a little bit of a, a mix of everything I certainly don't think that this is entirely on our strength and conditioning program and um, the, the medical team etc but I certainly don't think it's all bad luck I think I saw last week that uh, somebody had on big footy mapped out that we'd had 14 injuries in between that point in time and the Western Derby and nine of them had been collision injuries so contrasting that with a soft tissue injury somebody pulls a hammy that's obviously not a collision injury a collision injury would be you know Campbell Chesser getting his leg trapped under uh, an opponent and straining his MCL or whatever the actual injury was or it would be Dom Sheed getting a knock in the throat uh, and having a fractured larynx at training that would be a collision injury so stuff like that you, you can't really blame SNC on even even though someone like a Campbell Chesser is injured prone by his nature it's hard to fathom or maybe even make the argument that uh, that Campbell Chess's injury proneness led to him uh, injuring his knee in that fashion so there's definitely some bad luck here could you make the argument that because he's injury prone that affects how well he's likely to recover how likely he is to get a bad injury you know say it had been Andrew Gaff who is notoriously a Resilient player, physically resilient, doesn't get injured a lot. Would he be out for the same amount of time? Maybe not. And that leads to another question. What do you do about that? Do you avoid picking injury prone players? Does it then factor into your recruitment strategy, uh, looking at players who are less likely to get injured than others? I mean, you could do that, but I think that has its own opportunity cost because then you're suddenly compromising on talent to pick the guy that's less likely to get injured. Luke Shuey is a good example of this as a player who uh, had a similar path to Chester in his first couple of years, just constantly got injured, uh, only managed a handful of games in his second year. At that point in time, you'd look at Shuey and go, yeah, super injury prone player. And I know ironically he is now injury prone later in his career. But in between those two things, he's actually been quite a durable player. Played nearly 250 games, won a Norfolk medalist, won a premiership. So you wouldn't want to overlook someone with that ability in the draft just because they've had a bad run of injury going into their career. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. The soft tissue injuries, so like the recent spate of hamstring injuries that the Eagles have sustained lately. For instance, I think right now we have seven hamstring injuries right now. Not even since the start of the year. I believe that's seven players with hamstring injuries right now. The first thing I'll say is that a possible factor in that uh, and I think a very valid one is the fact that uh, we've played several games now without a bench. So obviously in the Derby, that happened. Uh, and in the Waffle team, that happened again this week. And we had uh, at least one or two, at least one hamstring injury out of that game as well. So what I'm getting at is less players on the field, more players under duress. 
less rotations, more strain on them, Jinbi having to play way more minutes, for instance. The cumulative effect of a mat is that the players who are playing are more likely to get injured because they're not doing their normal rotations. They're playing way more minutes than they should have. So I think that's a factor as well. But to be honest, we do have a history over the last handful of years, actually, of players just doing repeat injuries. Elliot Yo uh, with his groin. Uh, I think I do have a feeling that his current groin injury is not the same injury that kept him out for a couple of years, which is worth noting. But, you know, he keeps doing calves and stuff like that. Petrocelli keeps doing hamstrings strings constantly is that their own biomechanics that's leading to that i don't know this is really not my area but surely there is some accountability and culpability on behalf of strength and conditioning to prevent those sorts of injuries happening over and over again and that's just two examples there's been heaps more than that luke edwards is another one that comes to mind you could point to the most obvious one shuey liam duggan and his knee even nat nui with his knee issues over the years are the snc group or the medical group whatever you want to call them are they doing enough to prevent those re-injuries obviously i don't really know but the results kind of speak for themselves that is certainly a contributing factor we haven't prepared our players well enough. Before we go calling for heads and saying that we need to revamp the SNC department, you have to acknowledge as well that the Eagles did actually reshake and rejig that part of the football department as well. They, I don't know specifics, but certainly people got sacked, new people were brought in. There was a shake up there. So short of just firing everyone and replacing every single person, the Eagles have at least acknowledged that that was an issue and have tried to optimize it by bringing in new people. So if then the correct response is to sack them all again, well, to me, that doesn't seem satisfactory. Then there's the elephant in the room. Uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, both Optus Stadium and uh, Mineral Resources Park as the surface is being too hard. There's certainly been talk in the past and the spate of ankle injuries that the Eagles have sustained over the years. Uh, there's some, something there to suggest there may be a relationship. So if it's Optus, well, Fremantle have a slightly better run. I think they've had, you know, injury issues of their own over the years, but they seem to be going all right right now. So it's unlikely to be that. But they don't train on Mineral Resources Park. But the Perth Demons do in the Waffle, and they don't seem to have the same amount of injuries. So for me, there may be something in that, but it certainly wouldn't explain the issue in its entirety. So for the second year in a row, uh, whatever factors you want to decide to blame in your head, the Eagles to some extent have had their season buried. I wouldn't say entirely buried. There's still heaps we can get out of this year, but... It's a foregone conclusion now that it was going to be the bottom of the ladder. And the interesting part of this analysis is also looking at some of the, the teams that are going very well right now. And St Kilda and Essendon do have significant injury issues themselves, and they seem to be going perfectly fine. I think they're second and third or first and third on the ladder right now. So why are those teams doing better than West Coast by comparison? Well, there's probably a couple of factors in there. One thing I would suggest is the experience of our injuries probably still outshadow. I know St Kilda's like forward line has been decimated but the obvious answer to that is just that St Kilda's list is better equipped to cope with the injuries that ours is because over the years we've been challenging for a premiership we haven't really played the fringe players enough and certainly not in roles that will really develop them so for instance you know we might have some young on bowlers coming to the side but they're often sort of chucked on a half forward flank not really attending the center bounce that often and the result of that is that our middle to lower tier is just terrible and by contrast i can only conclude that st kilda and essendon have done a much better job at this it's also gutted us in really key areas of the ground and st kilda's forward line issues are very very key but they've certainly got enough talent as it stands right now to cope with that but in the midfield west coast just definitely don't when you take out uh, Nick Natanui, obviously, back-to-back um, -back All-Australian in the two years before he got re-injured again. You also factor in that we didn't have a replacement for him. Bailey Williams wasn't really ready to be shouldering the responsibility that he currently is, and he's had some issues as well, probably taking on too much. Then it's a, it's a notoriously shallow midfield. I think the top tier is okay at West Coast. Structurally, not so much, but in terms of the individual, Shui, Yo, and Sheed, they've been injured this year as well, and we don't quite have the depth to be able to cope with that. In fact, the fact that Ruben Jimby is coming in as an 18-year-old and he's just a walk-up start to this side shows that the, the competition for that six or seven spot in the midfield hasn't really been there. So what I'd say is while other teams are dealing with injuries and the fact that those teams seem to be coping okay with it doesn't quite render our issues irrelevant. So the Eagles now currently sit uh, at round six. Apologize if that uh, blower is going off. There's so much gardening over here. Somebody was using a right on lawn mower in their front lawn, which is tiny. But the Eagles currently sit with like 24 fit players on the 
on the list right now and it's only round six or seven what is the outlook for this year well i think there's still a fair bit they can get out of it we have to say this side has improved massively on last year it may not look it because we've just played geelong and melbourne and and for certain quarters in each game we've been blown away but for other periods of that game we've stuck with them which you could not say happened very much at all last year if at all this is an opportunity now for us to continue to get games into in particular the the young middle tier of our list so we do know the draftees look great Jinby looks great Noah Long looks great Hewitt in my opinion looks great obviously he's shown it a lot less at AFL level but what we need to start doing to smooth out this transition is take this opportunity to get some of these guys that we think have a future at AFL level to 50 games as quickly as possible which is not a one season project it's going to happen over the next two to three so you've got to do it within reason right you're not just going to pick the Ruckman Harry Barnett unless you absolutely have to which may happen to to play all of the next 50 games it's not going to happen like that but we've got two players in Bailey Williams and Jermaine Jones who are showing some genuine growth over the last year or so who are likely to hit 50 games either this year or next more likely next in the case of Williams by the end of next year all of Brady Hoff, Ruben Jinby, Noah Long, Rhett Bazo, Harry Edwards, Callum Jamison have the opportunity to be at least on the right side of 40 games of AFL experience. Hewitt, Chesser and Luke Edwards another player I've become a real big fan of those guys have the opportunity to be in the 30s so we need to envisage two years down the track when there's going to be heaps of these veterans who are ironically injured right now not available at all we need to prepare the list for that period of time so we're not still in the bottom two in 2025. So as far as getting games into the youth, like the draftees in uh, Jinby and Long are going to play every game they're fit for. Uh, Hewitt uh, probably a little bit f- further behind, but we don't know the extent of his ankle injury, so we're probably not going to have a choice on that matter. But it's the middle tier players that I think we need to, to pursue and, and see if we can get some growth from. The best examples of this, okay, Oscar Allen, for instance, he's only played 64 games of footy, missed a year completely last year. I think we're pretty comfortable with the fact that he is going to be hopefully an A-grade key forward. And a couple of other players that were less obvious, Jake Waterman and Jermaine Jones, look like they have what it takes to play and contribute at AFL level now. So Waterman and Jones coming on as that sort of 24-year-old sort of type to turning 25 perhaps, that's a big plus for us because that's a part of the list that we are really, really weak in. I think Bailey Williams, who cops a lot of criticism, has shown a lot of growth. He's not really equipped to be a number one ruck and that's not really his fault. His attributes are a high-leaping, high-marking, 199-centimeter ruckman who shouldn't really be the number one ruck. I feel like the number one ruck either needs to have incredible athleticism like Nat Nui or be, you know, closer to that 205 centimetre mark. There are exceptions to that, I know, but I'm just saying that Bailey Williams looks like more like a second ruck to me. But the fact that he is competing better and better every time and sure he makes mistakes. His development has been a positive for me, to be honest, and he's only played 31 games. And another one is Jack Petrocelli as well. I think we've seen good flashes from him. He just keeps getting injured and it's always his hamstring for whatever reason. But I feel like if we get a sustained block from him, he has what it takes to contribute at AFL level as a small forward. Then there's a few others we need to get an answer on this year. Uh, Luke Foley, who seems close to the team right now, he's looked pretty good at AFL level at times and then kind of fell away into the abyss. Everyone kind of forgot about him. This seems like a great opportunity for him to come back into the side soon out of necessity and potentially demonstrate he has what it takes. Zane True's played two games at AFL level, currently uh, been our best player two weeks in a row in the waffle. It'd be a great win for us if he comes in and shows something and earns another contract. And then there's Xavier O'Neill, who seems to have faded into the abyss a little bit of the year really well last year and this year hasn't really looked anywhere near it but I do note that he's been played as a forward at times and to me he just looks like a straight up midfielder but either way even in round one he had a lot of center bounce attendances and couldn't find his hands on the footy I think he had like eight touches in that game but either way we get an opportunity to find out for sure if he has what it takes so that's the opportunity out of this year so like I said, the, the silver lining out of this crisis of a year for the second year in a row is that we just find out more information about the young guys on our list. To some extent, we've had some wins for like the guys I talked about, and we need to ascertain for sure if the other guys don't have what it takes. I think we're playing some really improved footy. The game style has improved. We are fitter despite the injuries. I think in terms of how we our players have shaped up after preseason, looks much improved. They're able to play a more attacking game style. They're not going into their shell as much. Sure, they're going quiet for a quarter at a time, but still a massive improvement on last year where they would go quiet for three and a half quarters. What we'd love to avoid, and this involves luck, having four to seven changes every week, because I think that's what got us last year where we were changing up to, I think we had 12 changes one week, because it's that continuity, that synergy where the players can actually learn to play the together that's what's going to sustain the game plan more than anything players playing together getting experience getting a block of games and not have this merry-go-round of four or five players getting injured every week that's the bleeding that we need to stop we kind of need to just battle it out uh until the bye this year and it got to remind me of last year where we had this injury list early on and we felt that when our senior players 
came back in the second half of the year, we'd start to improve. But what we saw last year is that they came back and they were forced to play a little bit earlier than they were ready for and they didn't have the conditioning and we actually got worse as a side before we got better. So hopefully we're in a position where touch wood that, uh, there we go, that we aren't in a position where we need to rush back senior players in the second half of the year before they're fully ready. Like McGovern and Ryan are having pretty relatively big uh, surgeries on their hamstrings. Give them a good block of a mini preseason. If they only play the last four games of the year, so be it. But that's kind of a luxury. We need to make sure the injuries stop week to week before we get to that point. So where do we finish this year is the final question. Uh, well, I think I had us bottom four or five in the preseason. Uh, I have... I think there's a realistic chance we win the wooden spoon now because I have lost confidence that the injuries will improve enough for us to really start to bank some wins anytime soon. And we've got a tough fixture as it, as it stands at the moment. So we'll probably go to the mid-season draft, potentially with pick one. And the part of the factor is as well that the other sides in the competition aren't as bad as they were last year. Gold Coast, GWS, and even Hawthorne have the capacity to bob up and win games and probably more capacity than us at the moment. So bottom two, I reckon lock it in and potentially wooden spoon and that kind of depends on how Hawthorne go. But I'm optimistic because I think we've seen real improvement this year and despite the adversity, I think they've more or less done all we can ask. Eagles fans though, they love success and they want to sack the CEO every time we lose to the reigning premiers by 50 points. But this is going to be a long-term build and I'm kind of excited for it. I'm already looking forward to this draft. It's a strong one. It's a great year to have a top two to three pick in anyway. Anyway, guys, that's just me touching base on the West Coast Eagles uh, so far in 2023. Let me know in the comments what you thought and what you agree with, what you disagree with. Where do you predict we'll finish this year? How do you think we're going to go against Port? This video should be up before that game. I'm still in enjoying watching the Eagles games. Um, there's still plenty to look out for. One player I'm really excited to see take the next step is Luke Edwards. Uh, even Jai Cully, who I forgot to mention in this video. There's some talent there. Uh, we need to harness it, but we need to be patient as well. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.